Hi everyone, this is Grandmaster Eugene Perlstein with chess.com and we are here to do part three of our series of lectures in Knight A6, King's Indian. All right, let's start. D4, Knight F6, C4, G6, Knight C3, Bishop G7, E4, D6. So far so good, this is a classical variation. And now Knight A6. In part one, of our series, we covered so castles e5, we covered d takes e, uh, d5, and we didn't really show find any problems for black and rook e1 as well. And I showed you my pet line against the bishop g4. In part two, we covered most of the moves with the main line bishop e3, knight g4. Bishop g5, queen e8. We cover d takes e and h3. But besides those moves, there is a move that has been more popular recently, and the move is rook to e1. So this is kind of a combination of the rook e1 and bishop e3 systems. And being the rook being on e1 kind of creates this unpleasant x-ray on our queen on e8. So on, after rook e1, we play e takes d. And now white again has two moves. White can take on d4. This is a normal looking move, but white can play aggressively knight to d5. Really taking advantage of the weakness on e7, this e file, and potentially sometimes even the c5 pawn push. So black has to be very careful. So let's cover knight takes d4 first. So now that the bishop being on g5, the knight being on d4, the pawn on h2, black has a very nice attacking move that attacks all of those three at the same time. And this is queen e5. Attacking the bishop, attacking the pawn, and the knight. But the problem is white also has a very nice defensive move, knight back to f3, defends all of them, at the same time, queen c5, now we're hitting the f2 pawn. The best move is now bishop h4. And here, the position is, sort of resembles a little bit of a Marat Sibayan type of structure. Uh, except, of course, the difference being the knight on a6, but also white has a knight on f3 rather than a pawn on f3. And bishop on h4, what is the bishop doing on h4? So this is a very interesting position. I think black is doing fine after a move such as bishop to e6. And all of a sudden, it's really hard for white to do anything because this bishop on g7 puts so much pressure on this whole long diagonal. The bishop on h4 is just no match for the counterpart. White has tried some tricky moves such as knight d2 to try to get the knight going maybe on b3 and put in pressure on the g4 knight. But after knight e5, black usually got a good game. And if white were to play a rook c1 here, we can simply drop our queen back to b6, for example, to prevent, you know, as a preventive measure from the move knight b3. The knight can jump to c c5. And overall, we got a nice, pleasant game here. Nothing to worry about. If uh, white were to play knight d5, kind of an aggressive approach here, then we have a very nice resource, queen d4. Again, notice that this bishop on h4 is not controlling the dark squares anymore, and we can take advantage of that. Um, well, bishop can now come back into the game, but that will be a little bit too late. We can, we can take on d5, pawn takes, we can throw in knight c5. The pawn on b2 can be taken in the due course, for example, bishop e3, queen takes b2, and we just pick up everything, all the pawns, and black is doing great. Uh, there is no chance of white trapping our queen. So let's go back. 
So after bishop g5, it's a little bit too late. So rook b1 is a possibility instead. And now, again, we can take on d5, pawn takes, knight c5. And look at this picturesque position. We got two powerful knights, queen in the middle that can't really be touched. And uh, very nice position. We can follow up with a5, with f5, and this bishop is really misplaced. So that pretty much concludes this knight takes d4 line. And let's look at the main line, knight d5. So this is the kind of aggressive setup and has been played by some top players recently. So against knight d5, you got to be careful. Um, sometimes even white sacrifices a piece. But the move that I like the most is actually a quite simple move, c6. You, you gotta force the knight to give a check. Now, besides c6, uh, there is another move that I like maybe just as much, f6. You're basically forcing this bishop, very unpleasant bishop, to retreat. So bishop f4 is a typical retreat. And now you throw in d3, very interesting way to get, you know, return the pawn back. And so now queen takes, it doesn't really matter if queen takes or bishop takes. Our next move is the same, knight e5, queen d2. And this game actually happened recently. It was by two very strong grandmasters, Gelfand against Rajabov. Both are known to be very strong theoreticians. And Rajabov managed to beat Gelfand with black after the move queen f7, rook a d1. And I just want to show you the this game for a little bit because I think it really illustrates some key points here for black. Now knight c5 with a tempo, queen c2. So it looks as though all of white's pieces are centralized, but now they have to retreat. c6, so the knight is the knight has to move backwards. And now f5, x clan. Notice that now e4 is a problem, and the elephant sort of panic, he took on e5, and after d takes e, Rajabov got a dream possession of the knight a6, king's Indian. Um, now, if Gelfand didn't take on e5, for example, what other moves can he do? Let's try to figure it out. Well, two possibilities is maybe Knight takes e5, but after pawn takes, exactly the same story. But I guess you probably by now realize that the trick that Rajabov created is the move rook takes d6. Now you can take on e4, and after bishop takes e5, bishop takes e5, knight takes e5, queen takes f2, and game's over. King h1, queen takes e1 with mate. So that's basically the whole idea behind this f5 move. And to show you what happened next is pretty much one-sided bishop takes e5, pawn takes e5. And now Gelfand tries to create some counterplay on the queen side, but Rajabov simply follows, follows up with a very thematic knight e6 idea. So knight can go to d4. And Gelfand tries to open up the bishop, maybe at least some counter chance, but knight d4 anyways, knight takes, pawn takes, no better square than knight b1, and now after bishop e6, we can conclude here and clearly say that black is on top. So you see, even top gun such as Gelfand, you know, wasn't really able to match uh, the opening erudi erudition by Rajabo. So let me go back. And so this is the move that we looked at is f6. So this is very interesting creative idea by Rajabo. So first you throw the bishop back, you create a good thrust, uh, good square on the knight on e5, then you thrust with d3. Uh, now if bishop takes knight e5, doesn't matter, 
of queen takes, knight e5, doesn't matter. And then we queen goes to f7, depends, de defends the c7 pawn, knight jumps into c5, and all of a sudden black's pieces spring to life. Very creative game by Rajab. Now, other move I wanted to show you besides f6 is the move c6. Now, after c6, you kind of force white's hand. So white has to give this check. King h8. There's really nothing better than to take the bishop. And now knight takes d4. Again, this position is very typical for king's Indian players because white has some trumps and black has some trumps. White's trump is the bishop pair, you know, the, some key outpost in the center and this weakness on d6. Black, in the meantime, can regroup the knights to try to attack white in the center. For example, knight f6, pawn on e4 is a little bit weak. And now if white were to play bishop f1, queen e5, hitting the bishop, and all of a sudden white's pieces are a little bit misplaced, such as knight f3 drops a pawn. Uh, where is the bishop going to go? If the bishop retreats, the knight takes e4. This knight is going to be in some uh, disarray. So white can try to be very uh, sort of aggressive with this move f4, but now with a simple move queen c5, king h1, and, and now we just move rook uh, e8, and all of a sudden black again has a very nice pleasant position. You put pressure against the e4 pawn, uh, at some moment the knight can jump, and this knight is undefended, so white's position is a bit too loose, and I like black here. All right, so this concludes all the rook e1 stuff, pretty much. So now I want to give you some taste of what, what could happen in real games. I want to show you a couple of my own games with illustrated plans for black. One game I wanted to show you was after e5, bishop e3, knight g4, bishop g5, queen e8, this move h3. Remember I mentioned that you just simply play f6 and not worry about anything, the knight's going to come to h6. In this game, I played against uh, about a 2200 player at that time, Darwin Young. He played bishop c1, knight h6, bishop e3. So he's basically playing the same exact position without the inclusion of d takes e, d takes e, if you can recall. Knight f7, but now he commits, d takes e, d takes e, and plays c5. Notice that he did win this kind of tempo where I cannot take on c5 anymore. If you remember, in the other line, bishop was on d2, queen was on c1, and I took on c5. This is a little bit different. So now I play c6. I don't mind the doubling of my pawns, because my attack is going to be even stronger without the light square bishops. So he plays knight d2, he is basically following with his plan, and now f5. This is very important to get your counterplay in the right moment. So he plays f3, clearly knight c4, f4 all of a sudden, if white to retreat the bishop c5 falls and black's position is just better. So that's why f3. Now I throw in another tempo move, queen e7. And he says, well, I kind of want to play knight c4, but now c5 is weak, so I got to take on a6. So I take. And now he plays queen e2. Very solid move. Um, but probably already he's going a little bit astray because it's passive. Knight c4 was more active, but black plays the same plan pretty much. So queen e2, and the plan is the following, f4, bishop f2. Remember how I told you the knight on f7 is very good at supporting the attack? Well, here it comes, g5, rook fd1. So he's trying to run like crazy with his king, h5, knight c4, g4. That's it. I'm first, even though he has the d6 outpost, 
my talk is really crushing through. So he decides to finally make a run for it, but after G takes F, G takes F, I'm just doing very good with my next move, Queen G5. The bishop is coming to H3. All my pieces are active. White's position is about to crumble. I think the few, the next few moves actually illustrates my point. So King E1, Queen H5. So I kind of tie down his queen. At some moment, I'm also threatening to play Queen H1. He he finds this creative move to try to limit my counterplay on the D file, and now he wants to run away with his king. And this is what where I get him with my light squares. A5, X club. There is no defense against bishop a6. Total, he's going to be totally paralyzed on the f1 a diagonal. So a few more moves he lasted. Rook c1, bishop a6, knight b1. It looks like everything is defended. But with my next move, I'm paralyzing him even more. Rook d8. He defends knight bd2. Queen h1, knight f1. Notice how both knights are paralyzed completely. And with my next move, knight g5, this rook is now paralyzed as well. So he plays rook c3. So all of these pieces are totally paralyzed, all tied down. And I just make one simple move, bishop f6, and his position collapses. He's in Zugzwang, and really there is no defense against my threats. So this is a very interesting game. Shows you just how important it is to have very active pieces. And uh, so my I have countless number of threats. Knight h3, you know, I can play rook f7. I can do whatever I, I want to double in the d file. He simply resigned for the lack of better moves. So I think this game really, really well um, illustrates the point of, number one, the key plan for black, you know, the attack on the on the king side, the importance of, of light squares. Once you have control over the light squares, you're most likely to get an edge. And it's also important to understand that this knight a6 is coming to d4 pretty much unstoppable and sometimes. Little knight c7, knight e6, and the knight from f6 that makes a journey to g4 comes back to h6 and f7 where it again supports black's attack. So you see black's pieces are playing some key roles in fighting for the both the central square such as d4 outpost and going against white's king on the king side. So that's why I like this opening because it creates both positional and attacking chances for black. So thank you very much, and I hope you enjoyed this wonderful series in King's Indian, my favorite opening, Knight A6 variation. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.